Thanks to a grant from the National Science Foundation for making this research and this video possible. Beetles are arguably the most diverse order of animals, representing an incredible 22% of the described life on Earth. So it's no surprise that the Field Museum holds an estimated 5 million specimens within our insect collection. Some are wonderfully charismatic. Lightning beetles put on romantic light shows, rhinoceros beetles grow so large they can lift 850 times their own weight, and some rove beetles have bodies full of potent toxins that can cause serious burns if they're crushed against our skin. But so many others are easier to overlook, like the tenebrionids, known more commonly as the darkling beetles. They're pretty nondescript and are just kind of normal-looking black beetles. But I have a feeling that there's more to them than meets the eye. So I'm talking with Dr. Margaret Thayer. She's helping with a project to make these beetles and the data associated with them more accessible to researchers. And I want to find out why they're getting so much attention. There's yeah. a lot of beetles yeah. on yeah. this planet. Mm -hmm. do, you know, do you have an estimation for how many species this of coleoptera in general? Around. 400,000 described so far. Really? And there there must be at least a million. Wow! Because scads of them are being, being described and discovered every year. That's a lot of beetles. It is, it is. And, today, and, and most of them are tiny, you know, like that big. Like itty bitty. <laughs> yeah. Like too small to even register as actual life forms to the For, naked eye. To the, to the untrained naked eye. Yeah. After you get used to it, you can pull a piece of bark off a log and recognize a feather wing beetle that's about a millimeter long and say, oh, oh, Tilead's good. Oh, and they're larvae, too. Oh, excellent. Oh. And suck them up. That's a fun party trick for you, I bet. <laughs> oh, yeah, get a lot of use out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're talking about darkling beetles. Right. Which I have, n I know nothing about these animals. Mm -hmm. They're also a pretty big family. They're on the order of 20,000 described so far, which is pretty good as, be as beetle families go. 20,000 species. Yeah. But they look the same. No, they range from about that big up to about that big mm -hmm. and different forms and everything. If you went look through all the drawers of Tenebrionids here, you'd, you'd get a slightly different impression. And what makes a darkling beetle a darkling beetle? So it's a little tricky. They usually have very thick, hard cuticle. They typically have a club at the end of their 11 segmented antennae. The antennae come out under a little shelf above the eyes. They have different numbers of tarsal segments on their three pairs of legs. Oh. The end segment of the leg and tenebrionids have five segments on the front, five segments on the middle, and four in the back. Do they live in just one kind of environment, one general area of the world, or, or where are they happy? Where are you well, going to find a bunch of them? They occur worldwide, but they, they tend to be most diverse and abundant in really dry places okay. because they've adapted to, to living in dry places. But they're also in moisture habitats, and so you know, we have them in Illinois, probably you know, a dozen or two species, I'm not sure. Wow. There are something like 1,200 or so species in North America. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So do you have a particular species of tenebrionid, of darkling beetle, that you like? Oh, I guess a couple of the oh. pie plate beetles. Okay. The real flat ones. Actually, we have a oh, drawer here. We could yeah. throw that out. There are actually a couple different groups of these have developed that very flat pie plate-like shape in us, both Australia and Africa. Why are they shaped like this little dish thing? I think it's to help keep them up on top of the sand when they want to be, but being able to, they probably go kind of side to side to oh, dig down into the sand yeah. when they want to. They look like little saucers. Yeah. You know what this, what they remind me of? Darth Vader. <laughs> like with his helmet. So, Dar Darth you know? Vader pie plate beaters. I know. Yeah. The, so, okay. Margaret, you mentioned another group of beetles that you have a fondness for. Yeah, what they, are we looking at here? These are forked fungus beetles, they're called. Bolitotherus cornutus, which occurs around here. You can find these here in yeah. Illinois? Yep. Weird. And they're called the forked fungus beetle because the males have two big horns on the prothorax. Weird. With fuzzy things on the bottom. What's the point? They probably use them somehow in courtship. Yeah. And the females don't have horns. They're, they're kind of cute and lumpy, but they don't have fancy horns like yeah. that. So that's fun. Yes, in fact, I mean, this, I'm one's from, this one's from Illinois. Oh, it's amazing. Yep. More beetle fun facts. These tiny and adorable forked fungus beetles have amazing adaptations. They respond differently to different threats. For most, they lock their vulnerable legs into specially shaped grooves on their underside and rely on their super hard exoskeletons to protect them. But if they detect a mammal's breath, they jut their back ends out and use their internal body pressure to turn glands in their abdomen inside out, exposing a cocktail of chemicals that stains the skin, smells terrible, 
burns and causes nausea. Other beetles in the darkling family also have chemical defenses. The desert stink beetle from the American Southwest has the ability to spray their mist of three different noxious chemicals in the predator's faces. For many, this is a pretty effective deterrent. So effective that another beetle who doesn't have this gland mimics the unique stance of the stink beetle, hoping that it won't be called on its bluff. But the stinky deterrent doesn't always work. Grasshopper mice use their hand-like front paws to pick up the beetles and stick them rear first into the ground. In this vulnerable position, the beetle sprays into the ground and the mouse gets a less smelly lunch. Also living in the deserts of the American Southwest are the blue death feigning beetles. They can't spray noxious chemicals like their family members, but they are some of the best actors I've ever seen. At the smallest bump or startle, they keel over and play dead. And bonus fun fact, their blue color comes from a thin wax coating. It seals in precious water and acts as a natural sunscreen. This is, by no means, the weirdest way darkling beetles stay hydrated. Young mealworm beetles pull water straight out of the air thanks to a specialized pad inside their rectum that's packed full of potassium chloride salts. The humidity in the air collects in the salt, just like when the salt in your salt shaker clumps up on a humid day. The mealworm then absorbs the water out of the pad and into their body. So if these beetles are uniquely adapted, a lot of them at least, to really arid, dry environments, does that make them an interesting group to study for people who are interested in understanding how animals may or may not adapt to things like climate change or a warming, um, yeah. dry environment in general? Yeah, it certainly could be. It seems likely that at least some of them might be able to expand their ranges as areas that are too moist for them now dry out. Hmm. Why are entomologists now particularly interested in making this information more available to one another? Well, it's part of an, a general movement to, to digitize collection, the information in collections, so it's more accessible and can be used for all kinds of research. The kind of most basic one is where different species occur to understand their ranges. And if we have a lot of old data, which museums are good at, as well <laughs> as newer data, then we can do a before and after mm -hmm. and look at things like how habitat change may have affected the distributions of species. Beetles then become just a really fantastic animal group to focus on when you're interested in learning or trying to better understand like big global changes. Right, like, but yeah, the beetles and all the insects have real potential to add to that. And the biggest barrier is there are just so many of them. Right. So many species, so many specimens, so it takes a really long time yeah. to get those data so that you can do things yeah. with them. Solve the mysteries of the world yeah. by st study beetles. Yeah. I think that's, that's, the, right. my, that's my takeaway. Yeah. More beetle research. That's right. There we go. Mm -hmm. Secrets of the universe unveiled. <laughs> The natural world is so full of stunning beauty. It can be easy to overlook animals like darkling beetles who aren't as flashy as the others, but they're worth a closer look. Even the seemingly simple lives around us have incredible stories to tell and amazing adaptations to explore. It still has brains on it.